day in Chicago, and we're going to grow in Chicago until Tom is out of jail, until Wolf is out of jail, until the Indian who is walking down the street is out of jail, and until Chicago is safe for the people again. The movement's belief is that what we want corresponds to the real needs of everyone who's oppressed, that there is a sense in which we are the people. Often that's hard for us to believe and harder to work from. We came to Chicago fearing isolation. What we discovered in Chicago was that we were part of much more than we understood. Expose the Democratic Party. Expose the force which really controls this country. So throughout the summer, movement activists considered the possibilities of a Chicago action in relation to their day-to-day -day work in communities across the country. I like talking. I like trying to get across to other people what I feel. I just wanted to tell you, tell you before you saw the film that what you're going to see is about a real group that is in Cambridge. And if you look at the film as a portrait of a reality that you could enter into, the film is made by a group called the Newsreel. Uh, they're here. I just wanted to explain to you what's happening today. We'd just like you to know that if any of you have a problem, you should come see us. And we're giving out these little cards. We'll give you a phone number. And you should call us up. Because the thing that worries me about the war is that I know friends who are over there. And I don't want them to be killed. And I don't want any more of my friends to be sent. And I know you feel the same way, too. Anyone to be gun ho for a, a war like of this sort is, you know, have to be out of their mind. I am going to talk about the, the BDRG a little bit, but I think the, the way I want to do that is to talk about what I am. I think of myself as an organizer. That doesn't mean that you have to be uh, draft organizers, but, but it's that style of life. See, where you say, what am I going to do with my life, and what's its relationship to social change? That is what I'd like to talk to you about. We've got to begin to provide the alternative to the army and the society. And I think that's why uh, one of the things that excites me about, about BDRG is not just that it, uh, it's, I think, good political work, but it's also, in, in many senses, an alternative way of life. That is to say, the modes are the way we work, the way we make decisions. Well, I think that's important. It's those kind of things that I think begin to open up new possibilities of, of belief, of thinking for people who otherwise are trapped inside the, the system and the army. The kind of thing that's going on here with the resistance and the sanctuary and the so-called conspiracy, that this may mean that Boston and New England were once again being the beginning point and the inspiration for a second and badly needed American Revolution. When I went to Vietnam and I saw the the way that the Vietnamese dealt with us, the very self-conscious, but, but collectively self-conscious way, that they would work out what they were going to say to us. It presented me with an image of, of the way they were organized. When you're carrying a camera around, I was carrying a camera, I, I didn't know what to point at didn't know what I was trying to, to photograph, because often what I was trying for was the inside of my head, and, and I couldn't find that out there. One of the interpreters comes up to you and he says, you know, you shouldn't think that the Vietnamese depend too much on the U.S. peace movement. George Washington didn't rely on the British peace movement to win the American Revolution for him. I came back from Vietnam with a 
clearer perception of what it means to do political work. I went into draft organizing with a new sense of bringing people together and self-consciously examining what we were doing, why, what we were trying to build. I met Alvin when we were canvassing. He was worried about the draft. He was about to be drafted. Worked with him for about six months before he was finally out of the draft. We were able to get a deferment for him. Most of us who were trying to reach those guys went through the demonstrations and the teach-ins and were frustrated by them. I worked in a factory for six months and went through all the arguments about the war and didn't move anybody. When we go to draft boards, we show draftees that dissent and organized resistance are possible. We argue with them that they get screwed by the system, that the system's name is capitalism, and that they must organize to oppose it. Listen to me, please. I hope you all realize that the Selective Service system in itself is a violation of the Constitution of the United States. It's anti-democratic. We didn't make any, have any voice in saying who was going to be on this draft board. We didn't say who was going to select us. We didn't even say whether or not we approved of the war. Excuse me. We need now your pre-induction notice or your draft card. You'll come up to the desk and check off. Go outside. If the bus isn't there, it's a train line bus. If it isn't there, it'll be there shortly. You can get right on the bus. Collective action is difficult because the draft isolates. Most men feel they have a better chance to get out on their own than by working together. Even those we encourage to speak out can't see beyond acts of individual resistance. A lot of my friends have died in Vietnam. Some have come home. I personally oppose the war and all wars and religious convictions. I also oppose and will work to establish a society that does not delegate the convictions of man and do not control the body and soul of man. Among us are some friends from the Boston Draft Resistance Group. They're here to help us and give us aid in the legal ramifications of the Selective Service Law, and they'll also be giving out some Vietnam GIs. Hi, this is Dave Landau from Boston Draft Resistance Group. What we learned was that draft organizing doesn't build mass organizations. Instead of working class youth, we recruited middle class students. But we built a group which did useful education and propaganda and helped those students become full-time radicals. No, not to the induction center. What happens here is guys are called to their local draft board. They're from then at the board loaded onto buses. Their names are checked off and the clerk may tell them something and then they're loaded onto chartered buses and they're all driven to the Boston Army Base. <laughs> Propaganda work led some of us to newspapers. We started one of our own, The Old Mole, and distributed several others. One of the most useful was Vietnam GI, an anti-war paper for soldiers put out by Vietnam vets. It provided a model for papers at every army base, like the fatigue press at Hood, the last harass at Benning, the shakedown at Dix. And having it around pushed us to do something we hadn't found a way to do, talk to men in the army. prisoners who've just been released by the DRV. The way we might handle it is to try to get press here before going in order to 
make the most of the argument that it's the anti-war movement who is able to get soldiers back. One problem is money, which you can guess. Now, I don't want you to give any, because I know you don't have it, but I thought you might know of some people who would be willing to give money for this kind of venture. Okay, here's Nick, and he'll give it to you. Uh, no? Um, listen, when I was over there, I, uh, Inge get, sent me cables, and that was really nice to get over there, you know, over on the other side of the world. Okay? And a cable like this is very simple. So I sent it to Vernon, and then the word... Hanoi. And you just ring up Western Union on the tele telephone and tell them you want a cable, and they'll look at you funny over the phone. Um, but it costs just the same as sending it to Saigon. It's just real, you know, it costs about $4. Okay? I, I'll give you back to Vernon. Okay. okay. Good. Okay, great. Okay, good. I'm very glad you called back. Right. But I will keep in touch. I'll keep in touch with you, don't worry. Okay, I love you too. Good night. Going to Hanoi is just another propaganda act. You depend in large part on the media, the mass media, to convey what you want to say. And they want to report a, a homecoming, a Doris Day homecoming. Participating in the prisoner release means using their press, not ours. The crucial conference is at the airport when the pilots return. We gamble that the pilots will say something useful and that the press will report our role. Okay. They won't uh, let uh, the newsreel come in to film, so we have to get them in. Press, they're going to have to use the other door. We use the other door, press, please. We're with them. Yeah. There's a little problem with um, the newsreel ones. Okay, you go ahead. Well, I told them that we're holding the conference, and not TWA, and not the State Department, but they're right. I don't know whether you heard me or not. I don't think we can fight it anymore at this point. Do you want to bring to each other? Yes, do you want to come in? At JFK, the pilot said only that they were glad to be back, and the press gave us little coverage. Moreover, Newsreel was barred from the conference through the connivance of the State Department, the airport security, and the union press. So we got little of what we wanted and wondered, as always, whether it was worth it. Well, we were weak, but... Well, you didn't I know. I mean, Christ, I don't know. Oh, sure we knew. You can always do what you want to do if you stay well, up. Well, if you knew, then I don't know why you did it. Well, because I, I raised it with... I was afraid to cross the boundaries of legitimacy. There's no way to be both legitimate and outraged today in America in front of news media. To get up and talk about murder and the death of children and young men, you can't say that. The body count is the way we judge victory. So many BC killed. That's the way all battles are reported. And they know that, that that's the way we judge success. And he said, how do Americans feel? And we started explaining, and then he broke in and just said, I think the body count, there's something wrong with that. He said, there must be something in the conscience of men that tells them when they read that, they must say, body count, body count. What is that? Get the exposure now, Jack, because we're using it. Each light, his light is different than mine. It's a king dollar. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> What's the matter, Dave? You can't take it? <laughs> My name is Vernon Grizzard, and I'm a draft resistance organizer with the Boston Draft Resistance Group. Um, I received a phone call on the night of July 3rd. You came on, I thought, very, very cautious, sort of like I'm a red, white, and blue all-American boy. I'm not very political. I'm just a member of this Boston Draft Resistance Group, which, uh, you know, has a disagreement with American policy at this point. I mean, you didn't come on as being a person with a political position that was allied with the Na uh, National Liberation Front. You said you had a phone call July 3rd asking you if you wanted to go to Hanoi. Who called you? I got a call from Rennie Davis. Was it ever a feeling yours that you ought to say, look, motherfuckers, this is what I saw in North Vietnam, and you're going to have to kill everybody there before they quit? While you were in Hanoi, did you get a chance to talk with any other captured flyers or captured Americans? No, we didn't. How would you term the act of the North Vietnamese? Would it be humanitarian? Would it be propaganda? Would it be something else? Questions and answers? Good. When you get in front of the mass media, 
You have to talk straight by them right. and use every question they ask you to say what you want. And if that's not in your mind, every minute that you're talking, they'll fuck you. Mitchum, S-T-E-W-A-R-T-E-W. Right now, anything we do publicly tends to become an action for the press. They report and interpret us to the nation. And since the press is controlled by interests hostile to what we want, we get defined badly. But often we have little choice about actions which we know will become media events. This is a rather important conception of what's apt to happen in Chicago and also what kind of a movement we're trying to build. We're trying to set up a, or help <coughs> contribute to a setup in which the energies of the anti-war movement can be unleashed or liberated. We are united on the demands of withdrawal of the U.S. military from Vietnam and support for black liberation. It becomes clear more and more that there's not going to be any more peaceful demonstrations when uh, demonstrations are going to stop. This could be an offensive uh, formation then. Yeah, it could be. I'm not saying that you just lead with your chin. If it develops that uh, the country is ready to take a step toward fascism, I don't think we'll avoid that by being pusillanimous or cautious. We're working for some kind of combination of planning and flexibility, which will, on the one hand, uh, just avoid complete chaos. We would uh, propose <coughs> recruiting out of either of these two meeting areas some people wanted a festival of life. Others wanted the candidate nominated under the bayonets of the National Guard. We'd come to expose the party we held responsible for the war and racism and to demonstrate our opposition. But in spite of all our planning, the actions open to us were still limited, conventional. Uh, for today, the major activity is the picket down in the loop of the Delegate Hotel. Those of you who are marshals have received marshals training, and those of you who intend to be marshals back in the park at 5 o'clock to evaluate what happened today and to talk about the action that's happening this evening. Two, four, six, eight. Okay. The United States, the state, the only direction is insurrection. All right, we're well, walking down to the revolution. loop to picket the, ma the major hotels where the delegates are staying, to confront the war makers and let them know we're, we're inside, let them know that we're starting to come into town, that this is the advance guard of the huge numbers that are going to be in later this week. We came here because we're opposed to the murder of Vietnamese and to the murder of black Americans and all young Americans who are subject to the draft. Yeah. 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 I mean, what are the cops going to do? Over there? Yeah. Over there. They're lined up along the street. We can't get over there. We're right. right. We're there. coming to right there. Yeah, but that street's just a street down the side. It looks to me like that street's just a, I mean, a dead end. They stay out there and do things right, we'll have no problem. It's important, I think, not to accept those limits all the time. We have to try to break them at points just to see. They're gonna, if they can get away with certain limits today, they're going to get away with more limits tomorrow. At every point that we can, try and turn off those marshals. So every time a marshal begins hurting people around, telling them that he's acting like a cop, tell them not to use the megaphone so much. A great opportunity was lost when we went down State Street in the middle of those lunch hour crowds. The march had, in fact, been disorganized. People have been allowed to flow um, any way they want. There had been very little that the police could have done to bust it. As it was, it was controlled and cordoned and contained and led. The marshals have not been instructed at all. We've ha had some discussions about that. And my view of it is that it's not effective to try to integrate this movement center and the Boston movement center and the people who were moving into some kind of positions of responsibility by going through the mode into some kind of centralized command. We don't have a centralized command. I don't. I mean, through the moat marshals. And nobody's given me any commands that seem to me to have a, you know, a solid overview of the situation. <laughs> I think things are loose. <laughs> yeah. The, the latest supposed insight from the police is that they, if, if we don't have the permits and we insist on going to the amphitheater, that we'll be allowed to assemble, and then we'll be given an order saying that we're illegal and that we must be, must disband, and if we don't disband after 30 minutes, everybody is subject to arrest. Our response is that 10,000 people constitute a permit. The city is uh, our servant and not our master, and that therefore we're going to the amphitheater.
People are going to line up to try to march out, and at that point, they're going to be tight enough on this side for us to come in and start just telling them in small numbers right. to move to the loop. Yeah, and then I think we should reform in front of the Hilton Hotel, because I don't know what else we do. We don't have a chance in this room. We can split from there. And yeah, yeah, but we got to get a move from SDS should go up and give something like the following round, that we find it extraordinary after what has happened, that this rally continues in the same bullshit way. That the arm chanters continue their arm, the Dillinger continue to don't have to name names. The speakers compliment us in the order of the meeting, that the liberal writers come up and give their short rap, yeah. and that the thing goes on and on and on. And, that end, and that the people who they are supposed to be here for, the guerrillas in Vietnam, that would never have happened if they had been up there. And that it's the last time that that will happen. When he says what he's going to say, everybody will know what to do. This rally is extraordinary. It began for us, when one of our brothers quite rightly lowered an American flag to half-mast, no one since then has mentioned the rightness of his act. It followed with an unprovoked charge of the pigs into our space. They're not going to let us out of this park in any organized way. So for the purposes of survival, you should move out you should float out in small groups and do whatever you're going to do outside of the park around the city. Don't get trapped in some kind of large organized march which can be surrounded. I'll see you in the street. Please laugh. Please laugh. How, how long would it mean we are not aware of the conversations that you've been holding here with Captain Green? This is a nonviolent march that so far we are only on the sidewalk. Uh, we are not even on the street yet, although it is certainly our intention to march to the amphitheater in the street because we think that the street is necessary to accommodate this many people. We're stubborn bastards. We may be nonviolent, but we're stubborn. And uh, so we are appealing publicly through the press through Deputy Commander Reardon. We don't march today. We've made very clear that we're, we have no uh, conflict. Yeah, come today. The order is, we sir, that there'll be no march today. We've been able to march on the sidewalk. No march today. Well, uh, we'd like to have a reason so that should be communicated known to the world. And we will let you know at the proper time that right now there'll be no march. And this is a legal walk. There will be no march today. If we come to Chicago only to make our presence felt, then we were successful. Because what happened next became a national spectacle. Millions of Americans watched the police riot. But the issue of Chicago became police brutality. Not the party we'd come to expose. Not the war or the racism we'd come to protest. 
Chicago gave us a success we couldn't use and suggested the limits of any attempt to talk to the nation. I came in here about a month and a month and a half ago. Oh, okay. And okay. came in from Louisiana, Leesville, which is Fort Polk. We had tried to establish a coffee house there, and the Army had gotten a hold of the information before we could get set up and had made it impossible to work or to live in the town. Um, harassment, uh, arrests, the whole shot. And they pretty effectively ran us out of town. And so we came here to Colleen, Jay Lockhart and myself, and uh, began working at the strut with one thing that immediately struck me about the town is it's much bigger than I had assumed. Uh, an army town is often just one street, uh, one business street, with the hawk shops and uh, the warehouses out on the, uh, out on the highway. And that's got that, too. It's an army-run town. Army says what's going to be done, when, how it's going to be done, and when it's going to be done. The bus station here. Where most of the guys come in from Hood and then go out to either Austin or Dallas or someplace like that. See, this is the pinball and nudie magazine type thing over here. Uh, and they're doing a pretty good business, you know. They, I mean, they got a lot of guys in there. It's a potentially very violent town, like any other army town. Uh, nothing like Leesville, which has on an average of 26 stabbings a weekend. The guys get off the bus and they're searched and the knives fall out. All that kind of stuff goes on. So we're going to constantly have to think about new ways of, uh, of attracting guys. We have four coffee houses in existence in Army towns. We got one in Columbia, South Carolina, at Fort Jackson. We got one in Waynesville, Missouri, at Fort Redwood. We got one here, Colleen, Texas, at Fort Hood. You all know where that's at. We got one out of Fort Lewis, near Tacoma, Washington. Now, the purpose of these coffee houses is very simple. That is, a lot of us who have been in the Army know what an Army town is like, know what a town is like that makes a living off of a base. We're here to say that things could be a little bit different. We're here to say that there are people who can come into a town, provide an atmosphere and an environment for guys in the Army and guys from the town who come. They don't have to be putting up all kinds of fronts. Now, we have three very simple rules here. Three very simple rules, and that's all. One, we got no holding in the place. If you're holding, it's a bad place to be. The sign over there says the man is welcome. We always remember the man is welcome here. It's not so much that he's welcome, it's that he's just here. <laughs> <laughs> we just go under the assumption that we've always got agents in there. And we do. But the attitude we take is, okay, there are agents there, so we're just going to be open. And everything we do is legal. If they're going to try and bust us, then they're going to have to confront our politics and our feelings that they don't want to do that. Everybody's welcome. Everybody's here to enjoy themselves, listen to the music. Michael Lane Morgan has a good theater tonight. That's it. That's all. Thank you. Indiana, but I lived in New York for better part of my life. And I'm used to places. 
I'm used to places like this. And uh, being in the Army, I can get over here and I can sit down and write poetry. And I can sit here and listen. And I can forget I'm in the Army for about 15 minutes to an hour or something like this. You know, your social activities are real limited. I mean, really, there's really not that much to offer a black man, really. How much more time have you got to go? Well, I've got a while yet. I've got over a year. That black guy's apparently been very depressed about the fact that he had a whole year left, and two days later he just split, and nobody's seen him since then. And uh, wherever you go, the GI is not welcome, you know? So the only thing to do is to find places that people like you hang out in. Yeah, I spent some time in the Fort Knox stockade and some time in Lebanon. The reason Gypsy was arrested was because he was the editor of the Fatigue Press. One CID guy said, we got Gypsy, so now we got the Fatigue Press. They decided after two days of trial that he was clearly guilty, that he got eight years. But he's been in jail since early September. He's lost 40 pounds. They've kept him in solitary. They've shaved his head. They just keep harassing him. They're trying to push him to the point that he will either hit somebody or try to escape, in which case they're going to shoot him. We've been open for two months when people started talking about Chicago. Big decisions on the part of each guy. Do I go to Chicago or don't I? One of the things we did was show the uh, newsreel film on the Pentagon. And guys saw the soldiers taunted by the demonstrators and stuff. And a lot of guys said, I just couldn't take it. I'd get in there and I'd get scared and I might start hitting somebody that I felt very sympathetic with. And I just can't go and be put in that position. Guys from Chicago would say, I can't go there. You know, the, the guy in the street could be a guy I went to school with, and I just couldn't face him. And it was pretty much decided that guys should go and talk to other guys as much as possible. They wanted us to go, too, so that they would have contact with the demonstrators. <laughs> I want to speak to the National Guard. Wow. LBJ and Jalen, your Brigadier General, is going to tell you that we're your enemy. We're not your enemies, we're your friends, we're on your side. And when they try and bust us, then put your cameras on it. Because I'm going to show you some shit. We've been around man. all night, man. We got more people. I'm going to break a whole lot of necks, man. They taught me to do it, I don't want to do it, man. Eh? I'm telling you. I was there two days, and if I had in? ammunition my rifle the first two days I was there, I'd have killed myself. I ain't bullshitting. But now, they show me a whole lot of good shit. Yeah, okay. And I'm going to show you a whole lot of good shit. And when I go back, I'm going to see worse than Vietnam anyway. But I think it's worth it. I think it. Are you going to go, what, you're going to go back and treat yourself? Yeah, right? they're going to take you, wait me Wait a second, why are you going to do that? Because I figured if McCarthy got nominated, we'd have a chance, man. But McCarthy just lost, baby. I it was a little difficult for me as a girl and I had trouble starting conversations because guys are so used to buying everything. You know, I thought they were gonna thought I was gonna think I was a whore. But since then, people have just gotten used to the idea that it's more than a coffee house and they expect to be talked to. Well, that's important. You know, came in here to sleep. Like at Bellwood, before we went to Nam, they said, you've got to buy bombs. Yes. And there was a few guys who said, we don't got to do nothing. And here comes the guys in my platoon, uh, my old platoon. They come running out the darn door and they were getting shot at and they head right through the perimeter. I remember it like, remember at Quezon, they were talking about they had dug yeah. tunnels yeah. like about 100 feet away from the perimeter. Yeah. I, I just spent too many nights in a rice paddy with, you know, bodies around me. I just, I just... I know what a mistake it is. <laughs> wow. How can you know anymore? 
to have lunch at least twice a week, you know, when you see rations and there are old decayed skeletons around. And they go out on ambushes. Like for a one month period, we go out on ambushes and we kill over 50 people, at, you know, in the early hours of the morning. And uh, you start looking at bodies because they've got to get their body count. And who's there? Well, the majority were women and children. And what were they doing? What was their crime? They were carrying food. They were carrying food to their, you know, their friends up in the hills. For anyone, anyone who thinks he can duck out of it and hopefully be a Kirk typist and not have to see any of that, he's making a mistake because he's supporting the war. The effectiveness we have is on guys' lives and on guys' thinking. And when they get out of the army, if they don't join the movement, then they go into a factory. And you do hear of non vets who are going back and there's trouble with. The unions are having radical caucuses, so it's spreading. The guys are very afraid of taking a step at this point. One, they're short. Two, the fantastic, fantastic retribution that can be uh, heaped upon them. They can be singled out. They can be divided in, to a much greater degree than in civilian life. So we talk about what they're going to do when they get out. We talk about how, in many ways, you're going from the frying pan into the fire try to enable them to see that the movement can relate to them there, too, to look for people in the movement. This is for a good 90% of the guys, their first experience with the movement, their first experience with any type of political thinking. But I think the impact we'll have on them is going to be one that will last beyond their stay in the Army. People think of newspapers as institutions RUT's not any kind of separate institution. It's uh, just another organizer's tool. We don't try to cater to the audience so much as shape and develop those people that are ready to rebel in this society. If we do our job right, we're going to either be put out of business by the cops or go under, under financially. That's what it should be all about. That's kind of guerrilla journalism. He's got a, one of those anarchist bombs, and uh, he's lighting a match to the fuse, but it hasn't got to the fuse yet. It's kind of poised over it, you know? And he's kind of grim-faced, and if you look at it, you're not sure if he's really gonna light this bomb or not. He laid information, the National Guard has got uh, units in Fuller and Boyce Parks, and there's three police command posts, three police centrals. Uh, we know two. You can't tell what it looks like until you see it. Shit, everything, man, what Chicago means. Really great. Then we get all this shit. Well, where's everything, man? I don't know. I think it should be the very first one. Everything America comes with a price tag. Oh, okay. That's everything. Okay, so we get... Okay, who's the slick-fingered person who's very good at dainty detail? They'll be the... I'll do correct. You're good at correction. Yeah, I did them with. Okay, why don't you take the seat over there? Right. They'll pass correction. No, no, don't. Mm -hmm. You're you're just gonna paste them on. Yeah. Okay, so you sit there with <laughs> don't the touch glue. It. Don't mess with anybody else. Yes. There we go. What is that supposed to represent? <laughs> that represents a little fun. Not only have we developed our minds and are prepared for Chicago, we've also prepared our physiques. <laughs> <coughs> Now, um, <clears throat> as of today, we have received no permits uh, for activities in Chicago. We have no park permits. We have no permits whatsoever. Paper is going to be distributed in Chicago. We're going to take up approximately 50,000. There's the, all the information a young person needs to know. Alongside that, underneath the up against the wall rat or like uh, preparatory information of things to bring to Chicago. As you said <coughs> yourself, this will prove that a democracy, unquote, cannot hold a major political convention without protection from the National Guard. You pointed out before that most of your emphasis and concern is for young people. Who are you trying to influence by this? Uh, countries outside of the United States. Do you think that this confrontation could take place without chaos, or do you think chaos is inevitable? What would be the ultimate goal that uh, 100,000 people could achieve at that convention? That's not the right kind of question. Yeah, but nevertheless, you've got it in your paper, see. And I'm on radio, and I can't yeah, but print radio, words over the radio. As you know, if you've studied media, is a much more emotionally hot medium than print. Much more emotionally hot. 
Jeff, let me return to this subject once again about what you have printed in the magazine and what you don't want to talk about on the air. You said that if you do, you're afraid it might inflame people. I'd like to ask you, who would it inflame? They are Jeffrey Sherrill, publisher of RAP, the former vice president of the Students for a Democratic Society. Alan Katzman, co-founder of the East Village Hunter. Martin Fishman, originator and member of the steering committee of Newsgreen. They're interviewed by Stephen Roberts in New York Times. Mr. Sherrill, maybe we can start by uh, having you explain exactly why there should be an underground press. Well, I think that it's pretty clear that uh, you can't get the story anyplace else. Uh, take Columbia, for example. Well, the New York Times is telling us that uh, the strike was dying, in fact, was growing. And all throughout the Times told lies about Columbia. Yeah, well, I don't know what people are like. People do, they get the interview on there. They sound like a lot of people who we know who want to come in and make this show. Why would that be people in? That's funny. Why not? Let's get it right. There's the real underground. There's the underground. Yeah. to Channel 13 for ourselves and on behalf of everyone who hates this society's media. We chose a liberal alternative like NET because we wanted to say that even the most advanced media are debased merchandising tools controlled by interests who serve only power. We wanted to say that people can act against media and can build their own media for their own needs. But we were so stunned by getting onto the program that we made few of the arguments we came to make. Now, now you're going to show now. Now you're going to show now. Let's go. Now, let's go. Here's how, by the way, an example. Here's how the underground still unit works. That guy's working right now. This guy's working right now. That guy's working right now. We're going to Columbia. We work inside with the action tower. We're going to work inside with the action tower. You cannot work as the media does behind, behind the lines of police. Why can't this just as soon be a radio station? I mean, all they're doing is listening to voices. Why are you sitting here? If you're going to show something, you might... Yeah, I can't say fuck on this TV station. We can right. say now. Right. Now we can't. It can be liberated. Is this for anything in itself, or is it not? Does your being here mean anything? Or what does it mean? I think I would like to stress again, that was a completely unplanned demonstration. These uh, individuals came and literally crashed into our studio. Of course, we did not hesitate to call the police. We go forth as human beings to remove these pigs, these hogs in the power structure, murdering and brutalizing people not only here in the confines of racist decade in America, but murdering and brutalizing and oppressing people all over the world. And when we go forth to deal with them, that they're going to always sit out there racist, scary, rotten pigs to occupy the people, to occupy the community, such as the way they have this park here occupied. Now, in just a second, there's a lesson that Minister of Defense Huey P. Newton teaches, that whenever the people disagree with the political decisions that's been made upon their heads, that whenever the people disagree with those political decisions, the racist power structure sends in guns and force to see that the people accept those political decisions. But we are here as revolutionaries to let them know that we refuse to accept those political decisions that maintain the oppression of our black people and other people in the world. This, this next week in Chicago will be a time in which we have to work out how revolutionaries would function, how they would practice. Before we hit the bridge, we, had, we went through some of the ritziest stores in the downtown area. And like, and like nobody picked up a bottle, nobody picked up a rock to throw it at those, at those store windows or anything. 
Huh? Yeah, but they were all smashed in the poorer sections on the other, on the, on the, on the, on the, the south side of the, of, of the town. Well, all right, that was, that was what I saw. And then that could be combined maybe with the, uh, the people of the mass of these places. Chicago still seems questionable to most movement people who argue that issues weren't raised, consciousness wasn't changed, and street fighting isn't always a useful tactic. But those arguments miss the real importance of Chicago, which wasn't the public protest, but the experience of coming together to work and to plan in the movement centers. That would be good. That would be and then our advantage, the best, would be if what we said is going to happen, happens, you know, that you people are going to get your heads knocked in. Because that's true. And I don't think that we should be in a position where we were part of the thing that got those kids' heads knocked in. I don't think they have any anticipation that they're coming to a police... A they're police really city. naive, man. Oh, they're they, really naive. That's not naive. They have no reason yeah. to think that. They have no oh, reason oh, to expect that. Oh, oh, Come on, they have it. It's true. Bullshit. Who's giving them a reason? Oh, they don't know. That's not... So I think we have to get back to that question. Whether or not people decide to fight, or don't decide to fight, or don't decide to fight and get destroyed anyway, we should be there. And if people can think of other things to tie up the cops in other parts of the city, that's great. That group of four or five should stick with its group and get them there. So get them to the place where they can take care of business. All right, you got a whole night to wrap with folks. That's what we're here for. We're here to work on. There's more people here than there are in Lincoln Park. Hey, people, come back for Hey, there's more than this. You can come back for all over the fucking place. The activists in the SDS Movement Center knew each other from previous work, knew why they'd come to Chicago. I got nothing to say, but I think the meeting should start again so we don't go on. But our numbers were too small for either successful confrontation or adequate defense. We weren't sure who else was with us or what they were prepared for. People are going to be sleeping in the park and so far, there's no indication that the police are into letting them sleep there. Uh, the entire bunch of yippies who are supposed to be coming in on Sunday, they've called their thing from Sunday to the end of the week, and the entire bunch of people who are coming in under the aegis of the mob are going to be in the park. The mob is asking its people to join the yippies in the park and to stay in the park. And as far as we can see now, there's going to be a massive confrontation taking place there. <laughs> They're creating it on their self right now. They want the truck for the, for the band to play on so everybody can see the band. So they want to keep the truck up. Why? That's all I'm saying is why. Why all the harassment? I see people walking around. They're going to find out, like I said, it's just a small demonstration. Someday it'll be a hundred times as much if they don't lay off the people. Now they said that the bike people the hippies and the yippies could never get together. You understand? Well, I'll tell them right now they're wrong about this. Because the bike people, the hippies, and the yippies and everybody are definitely going to get together if they don't put this unreal harassment they're putting on all of us. march if not for us. And you're going to call that the most political thing we'd ever been in? A McCarthy streets, man. And what we want to do is at least what we did last night, which is to help move people out of the park so that they can get into the streets so that they can start doing stuff. You can <laughs> unfurl beer con flags all day and say to the streets, and a lot of times people ain't ready to move. It's only when people are ready to move and have a, a certain kind of collective sense that it's time and that's necessary that they're going to move. Whether you move in a large group or in small groups, you're going to get the shit knocked out of you. That thing was made by the police, because if the people actually had been able to march down to the loop, they'd gotten to an empty loop, what would they done? Picketed? You know, I don't know what the hell they would have done. What they proved by getting the shit knocked out of them was nothing new to Chicago people, because Chicago people know what the cops are like. They were able to impress a lot of ladies from Iowa and other places like that, the Democratic National Convention. Things are brutal in Chicago. Okay, they know that now, if they didn't know it before. Report about what happened down at the uh, bridge, where it seems that they really had people in a kind of a pull de sac and let them go. And I'm not sure that that's going to happen tonight. And, and I'm not sure whether a large march down, a large group of people will be able to happen tonight if they decide to bring in mass force. 
bring out their, you know, their submachine guns and their, their carbines right make, off the back. You want to make a suggestion? Fine, right, I want to make a suggestion. I think it should be discussed. Does anybody have anything else that they think is really important they want to say, and then we'll get out of here? Yeah. Well, I think you people are talking like, like you're, uh, you're doing guerrilla warfare tactics in a vacuum. People are talking about, about uh, consulting the French and see what happened in this strike. Now, you know, damn well, you know, you guys came out of the park last night, you held the street for a couple hours, you stoned a couple cops, you broke a couple windows, and there was no general strike today in Chicago. And there's not going to be. And you guys assume, I mean, there's been no work done in this community, and there's no, there's no the people in the house, they don't want their windows busted. And you guys are going to hold the street for an hour, and then, and then the second thing that you guys have all forgotten is that the cops let you do it last night. Now, they're not going to be so inclined to let you do that again. Why do you feel that? You don't know that. You don't know that. They're getting impatient. What happened? I don't know. What happened? focused on the fight for the park. But just as we didn't recruit the hundreds of street kids who showed up to fight the police, so we didn't organize or lead them. We joined together in the park and in the streets and learned how to move against massive force. troops were called out, we felt we'd won. But won what? All we'd managed was a disruption. But we'd fought for four days, and so many people had joined us that we felt much more than ourselves. For once we felt we were the people.
left Chicago to go back to our own communities. Our sense of triumph quickly became a memory. What we went back to was the tough day-to-day -day work of building a revolutionary movement. And what Chicago finally came to for us was a feeling of what it might be like after making that revolution, when anyone could say, we are the people.